Welcome everyone. My name is Vanessa Timmer. I'm the executive director of One Earth, and I'm very pleased to be uh, having the hosting the Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program Contributor Cohort um, Leadership YouTube series today. And today I am very pleased to have Marcus Carson from the Stockholm Environment Institute. He is the senior research fellow and he leads the Arctic Resilience Assessment and has also been leading up the Sustainable Lifestyles part of uh, Stockholm Environment Institute's work. He's part of the coordinating desk for the One Planet Network uh, Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program. Marcus has worked on issues linking science, policy, and practice for some 35 years, and he's been in very diverse roles from advocate to practitioner, policymaker, teacher, researcher. He's very interested in how people through organizations, institutions, um, and institutions organize and respond to pressing social and environmental problems. And he's worked on issues from health to integration to climate change, Arctic change. Uh, his background is in psychology and he earned his PhD in sociology from Stockholm University. And outside of work, as I know myself, he's a sea kayaker, uh, runner. I've been able to kayak next to him, a musician, a husband, and a father. So Marcus, welcome Marcus to this, uh, to this session today. And in a couple of sentences, what drew you to the sustainable lifestyles and education topic? Over to you. Yeah, well, interesting. Thanks, uh, Vanessa. Um, I mean, this this process uh, was to a large extent a, a function of chance, uh, and, but also a function of a good a good match with the kinds of issues that I've worked on that I'm interested in. And as you probably heard from the introduction, the, the uh, you could look at it and say, well, that sounds like confusion to me. But it's actually the connecting point between all of these different issues is that people are at the center and some sort of process of uh, social change is at the center of all of those, even if uh, some they happen in different places or around different kinds of topics. Yeah, so really it's that kind of people at the center aspect that really links all of the different aspects of your career together. And Marcus, could you speak a bit more about how you channeled your interests into that career? You know, basically in a few words, tell us how you got from where you started to where you are now. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's been a 40 year uh, trip. Uh, so it's actually 40 and not 35 years. I guess I need to update my description a little bit. But um, it's, you know, it, what I would say is there's been a, there's been an interesting mix of chance uh, and in and a specific set of values and interests, uh, and going back to the to the early stages in this thinking about lifestyles, um, there are a handful of choices that I made that fit the lifestyles issues uh, that had nothing to do with environment, uh, frankly. But uh, just as a couple of concrete examples. I, uh, I decided to stop eating meat in my, well, 42, 43 years ago. Uh, I was, uh, I had a girlfriend who was a non-meat eater. Uh, I'd read a bunch of Gandhi. I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. And then I read a book called Diet for a Small Planet that offered some insights, not only about um, the uh, the production efficiency of vegetable or plant based protein rather than animal protein, but also gave some ideas for how to mix protein sources in order to get the balance that one needs. So I decided to test that out a little bit. Uh, I read another book that talked about the food processing industry in the U.S. that sounded pretty nasty, and uh, so I experimented with with not actively seeking out meat and. Uh, that worked pretty well. I was I was surprised that after a few months that was not a big problem. So I decided to actively exclude it, and it was a mix of, you know, some values. Some of it was health reasons. I thought it would be healthier, and it was cheaper and easier. <laughs> so uh, that's lasted for a long time. I haven't been extremely hardcore. If if I've had uh, food available, it has meat in it. I will. You know, I've plucked out the meat and not worried about the, the details, but it's held for 40 some odd years. And uh, I would say that it's contributed to my health being quite good at this stage. The, the other thing I think that 
that's fed into it is that for some reason early on, I decided that I was not likely to be pursuing a career uh, that was built around earning lots of money. And so I cultivated free time activities that, that, uh, that were low cost and, and generally pretty low impact on the environment. So it was things like hiking and paddling and uh, canoeing and those kinds of activities that I really enjoyed, but also did, you know, had quite low overhead costs. And uh, so those have been manageable over the years, even though my early career, I picked jobs that, uh, that paid quite little in cash, but provided a lot of satisfaction. Uh, and as you heard in the introduction, I mean, I've, I spent years as uh, uh, working with a grassroots organization, uh, low income people, a labor union. I spent a decade working on health policy. Uh, and uh, shifted to environmental policy when I came to Sweden and had a chance to do a PhD. And what all of those connected is this idea that we, we need to work together to improve the condition, living conditions for not only those of us who are pretty fortunate to start with, uh, and I have to claim uh, being pretty fortunate growing up in a middle-class family uh, getting a college education that uh, was paid for with some money I earned, some loans and uh, help from my folks uh, that allowed that created a lot of space to think about what's really important out there uh, and then to engage with with those things. And the lifestyles work came in fairly late. Uh, but as with the uh, some of the other work I've been involved with, I was stunned to understand how much impact lifestyles have on creating the environmental problems that we're struggling with and how much potential impact there is if we can get those activities under, under better control or steer them uh, better, how much positive impact it can have on addressing climate change, on reducing biodiversity loss and, uh, and on uh, reducing waste and making us happier at the same time, uh, finding activities that are more satisfying. Yeah, thank you so much, Marcus. And uh, as you're speaking, I really appreciate the fact that you spoke to us about some of the lifestyle choices you're making yourself from uh, removing um, meat from your diet to uh, finding activities that are low cost, low impact, and your guitar keeps popping up beside you and <laughs> Uh, in the frame. So I know that music is one of those things as well. Uh, and the choices you made to basically, and the for, the privilege you've had to be able to also make some choices around um, where you focus your energies and improving living conditions. And as you say, the lifestyles is this untapped opportunity potential, and it has a massive problem, but also an untapped potential for really help moving us forward uh, at this point in terms of addressing many of these combined issues. So I wondered if you could speak about Stockholm Environment Institute itself and uh, tell us about your work. Um, and I'd be, we'd be very interested to hear about your work in the Arctic as well, which has been a big part of the work you've been doing. And then maybe you can shed some light on some of the things that are happening at Stockholm Environment Institute on sustainable lifestyle and lifestyles and education. And Amongst all of that, what is something exciting that you're working on right now that might still be in development or something you found has been very exciting for you in this work? And I, I know we've got some slides uh, as well, so just let me know uh, when you'd like to show some uh, of those slides, yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I can say a couple of things. I spent, uh, uh, you know, there's so many funny, funny turns here, but I, I met my wife on a um, motorcycle trip uh, in um, in Spain, I shipped a motorcycle over and uh, uh, traveled with a friend for for three months. Uh, she's Swedish, I'm American. We made uh, we made a deal when she came over to visit initially. Uh, after we decided we were going to make it more permanent, that we would live in both countries. Uh, so one of the vows when we got married was we would live in both countries. And after a decade living in the South in the U.S., it uh, my turn came up. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> I said, really, do we need to do this? And uh, uh, and we did, and it opened up the opportunity to do grad study. So I was at the sociology department for uh, for several years, and academia is really interesting. It's really uh, 
uh, it's challenging, lots of thoughtful people, um, but it often prides itself on this dis keeping a distance from activities in the real world. Not always, but, uh, but often enough. And I felt like I wanted to take what I learned, especially the, the more abstract pattern recognition that we call theory, uh, that I wanted to take that and apply it more directly in work. And I had contacts at Stockholm Environment Institute uh, who I'd worked with to do a report on the Obama administration's potential for changing uh, the U.S.'s direction around climate change. And that led to me uh, applying for a job at SEI and coming over where, where that social science knowledge was much more um, actively useful. And rather than aiming at trying to get people to read a journal article, then I could focus on trying to apply the science to the, to the work. So, uh, so I came over to SEI because it was mixing science and uh, this kind of scientific insights that can be so important with policy and also practice. So trying to make those links between new insights, uh, developing those into new uh, institutional structures, guidelines, policies that help to support uh, more positive activities and helping to change what we do uh, whether that's around uh, businesses polluting or uh, or people, uh, you know, dealing with each other in a more constructive way, so that was my entry to SEI, and I was working on climate change uh, at the time. Uh, we had a project dealing with the Arctic called the Arctic Resilience Report. Uh, I was not familiar with the Arctic uh, at the time. And uh, the person who led the project uh, had to leave the project. So there was sort of a gap there and they needed a senior person who was uh, sort of a, um, an all purpose kind of uh, person, a jack of all trades type of person who could step into it. And I thought about it for a while. I thought it seemed pretty interesting. It was a mix of countries that have a real impact and in a space on the planet that is changing faster than almost any other place. So I said yes to that, uh, spent uh, five years working within that project, uh, learning about resilience, learning about change in the Arctic, learning about indigenous communities and how they're trying to preserve their, uh, uh, their lifestyles, their ways of life that are anchored in ecosystems, but not using up those ecosystems at the same time. Um, and that carried into a project on wetlands, um, Arctic wetlands. Turns out that 20% of Sweden's greenhouse gas emissions come from degraded wetland areas. It was, I was shocked at how much of those emissions come from wetlands. And it's not just Sweden, it's other Nordic countries, it's other countries around the world. And uh, I've often described that saying I'm a, you know, my training is in psychology and sociology. My view of wetlands was that it's a source of mosquitoes, wet boots. And when I was growing up, it was a place where monsters were, were found, right? Creature of the black, from the black lagoon and large, you know, long toothed critters that uh, you wouldn't want to encounter. Uh, and then it turns out that it's this huge, important type of ecosystem that houses biodiversity. Uh, it stores carbon uh, like crazy, and it's really important for us for, for water resources as well. So, uh, so I dove into that and have had the good fortune of uh, 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 securing some grant money to pursue that. And we have another year uh, and are making recommendations to the Arctic Council that uh, we hope will, will have a low implementation threshold, but potentially large consequences. Uh, and that's been quite exciting. Then I would say that, that something similar has happened with our uh, sus sustainable lifestyles work. But the projects that I'm working on right now have to do with the uh, steel industry in Sweden. The steel industry is making an enormous transition or transformation from producing steel with coal to producing it with hydrogen. Uh, and that process in itself is quite a remarkable process. Uh, here in Sweden, we're analyzing this process to identify the 
the factors that have contributed to making that transition possible. And certainly a, a shift that's not happened without a lot of struggle, uh, but it is very promising. And it looks like the Swedish steel industry will lead in uh, developing steel that, that has important valuable properties for sustainability that's also produced without having to use coal. Um, this wetlands project is another and now the sustainable lifestyles project. And I could, uh, I could wrap that a little bit just by saying there's a lot of discussion about wanting to make changes to save the planet. And what I like to refer to is the planet's fine without us. Uh, we don't need to worry about saving the planet. It's us we need to save. Uh, so that's where we need to engage in, uh, in this lifestyles work and looking for ways to, uh, to find this magic match between uh, finding activities that, uh, and ways of living that make us more uh, satisfied, more happy uh, with, with our lives, and at the same time have less uh, negative environmental impact. And we know there are pathways for, for doing that. I also want to acknowledge there are many places in the world where people aren't getting enough. Uh, so we need to redistribute some and make sure that where people aren't, aren't getting enough food or don't have enough, uh, don't have clean energy, uh, those kinds of needs that we can, there's enough, there are enough resources to be able to raise the standard uh, at the same time and not have to lower the standard elsewhere, but to change that standard elsewhere so that we, uh, we can be more satisfied with, uh, with our lives and not waste uh, resources that don't need to be wasted. That was kind of a long description. I have a, there are a few slides here I can run through. That sounds good, yeah. Some I mean, of what's exciting about, sorry, about SCI ahead. is that there's so much going on. Yeah, so much going on uh, in, in different areas and uh, it makes it an exciting place to, uh, uh, to work at all levels, both uh, whether uh, you know it's colleagues coming in with with new ideas and a lot of energy, or folks like me who've been around for a while, and uh, you know want to pick our fights uh, carefully so that we can try to match our experience with the places where we think that'll have the most impact. But uh, Vanessa, you've got the slides. I can point out just some of the basics here. That sounds great. Yeah, thank you for taking us on that journey also with from climate change to the Arctic, to the work that you're doing in wetlands. And as you say, very exciting to get that funding to look into that in more detail and the current work on steel. So yes, let's take a look at some of these slides um, of some of the work that's happening in uh, SEI as well. Um, so yes, if you can uh, um, speak to those as well. So uh, this first one is, is looking for ways to essentially remove fossil fuels. Um, one of the strategies is just, just to leave it in the ground. If we set up new infrastructure for, for extracting fossil fuels and refining them, then there's a lot of lock-in that takes place. So the, uh, the, the most efficient and effective way to, uh, to make that shift is, for starters, not to invest new resources in um, in extraction and, and refinement and help to identify pathways to, to shift off of uh, fossil free or to shift off of fossil fuels and at the same time um, maintain a, a societal structure that, that provides a good safety net for people and good uh, a power, you know, strong infrastructure. Sweden is a good example of a country that's, a, that's been able to raise its standard of living at the same time it has reduced its dependency on fossil fuels. That's an interesting story in itself because it dates back to the energy crisis of the 70s. Uh, and it also includes some good fortune having, having uh, fast moving water in the north that provides for, uh, for hydropower, having lots of open areas uh, that not without some difficulty provide areas that we can mount up uh, wind power. But uh, to do this mesh with eliminating fossil fuels uh, in the energy system, especially at the same time that we maintain and build out a welfare state uh, that provides for the things that, well, that the Nordic welfare states provide. So to the next slide. Uh, so uh, the Candies project is really about providing uh, information feedback around uh, sustainable food production and consumption. So shifting to plant-based 
food and providing, I mean, one of the really important things in these change processes uh, is, is to know where, what kind of impact our personal choices is having, but to also understand how those personal choices fit in a larger context. And the Candies Project uh, is helping to divide, develop some of these kinds of digital tools that will help us to, uh, to identify the, the more incremental changes that we make ourselves and how those fit into a larger into the larger context and have a, actually an impact that is identifiable, measurable at a country or even a global level. Uh, to the next one, agrofossil, agriculture for food security. Uh, this is very much around uh, dealing with hunger and food security in the global south. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the details of this, but um, but the uh, SEI has a long history. It was actually founded on uh, meshing environmental protection with development, and obviously an important part of development is ensuring that people have uh, have the food that they need uh, to not only survive but to be healthy to raise their kids without fear that uh, that food is running out. And a lot of the food production that's very effective is at a, at a quite small scale uh, and also enables people to engage with their environment. Um, it is interesting that people engage in the small scale farming, they know where food comes from. Uh, whereas in the north, northern parts of the planet, our experience of the source of food is often limited to grocery store shelves. Uh, if we don't know where food comes from, it's a lot easier to be wasteful and careless with it. Uh, so the agrofossil project is uh, is really about connecting those things, uh, providing support so that people can uh, deliver on their own food security and take control of it. Uh, next slide: urban circularity assessment framework. Again, this is this is very much SEI has done a lot of work around tools that provide uh, some kinds of metrics that tell us how we're doing when we, uh, when we set goals, uh, whether it's circularity or reduction in consumption of, uh, uh, of different kinds of resources. So that when we make those choices to, uh, to shift what we're using or shift our activities, we have some sense of what kind of an impact that's having both so that it, we have that encouragement to know that, the, that it has some impact, but also we can see uh, how that is um, influencing the, the problem that we've been trying to tackle. Uh, I think we can, we can just flash through these. Uh, uh, the Vinci project, uh, some, some testing of uh, augmented reality for, for training, uh, looking at low carbon tourism. Uh, that takes a number of different uh, different forms. My own low carbon tourism is, has been uh, things like uh, taking a kayak, spending a week out in the archipelago where I, I take, um, the great thing about a kayak is that you can load it up with luxuries, uh, food and uh, wine or, or uh, cognac, uh, a little larger tent than you would carry on your back. Uh, you go out to a, an interesting place and you hang out with friends <clears throat> and spend that time enjoying a social experience, but with good food and uh, good food and drink in amazing sort of nature settings. And there are many of these kinds of things where instead of flying, you can take the train or um, or engage in activities that are uh, that are very social, very satisfying, but very low uh, low impact on environment. And uh, supporting companies that's that help to facilitate that kind of tourism. There's a lot of work on the next slide, uh, number six, a lot of work around finance uh, because it's obviously channeling resource flows to invest in these kinds of things is really important to triggering and scaling up uh, the kinds of activities. Cities are such a key uh, core of activity. It's, it's, uh, it's a level of governance where things are manageable and it's the, it's the scale where we do what we do, where we carry out our professions and our jobs, where we consume what we consume. Uh, and it, it's really where the rubber hits the road, you could say. Uh, and so ensuring that there are financial streams going to cities is really a, 
critical element of the, this transition to sustainability. Uh, the next one, number seven, is uh, school food for change. And obviously, our routines and habits and knowledge get set in place when we're children. Um, I can tell you uh, of my two kids, one of them is uh, one of them followed my uh, dietary habits. The other one hasn't. Uh, and uh, my daughter, who decided to stop eating meat around age six, we uh, she was asking, so is this, you know, she grabbed a muscle in her arm and said, this is this meat. And I said, well, yeah. And she says, okay, I'm not eating it anymore. Uh, and we haven't eaten meat at home since the kids were kids were born. But it was that uh, learning and understanding there's a difference and you can make choices about those things. And you set habits in place. Uh, so schools are a really important place for not only for education, but for setting, uh, setting new patterns and consciousness about the impact that our food has. And then the, the last slide here is a selection of images pictures of colleagues from around the world who are engaging in these kinds of projects, uh, these kinds of activities and facilitating a shift to lifestyles that are more satisfying, uh, less impact, and can help lead the way, not only by increasing knowledge and helping people to change what they do, but by setting our own, by being the change, I guess. Um, so that's uh, a quick tour through SEI's work, there's a lot more work out there. Some of it directly links to lifestyles. Some of it is more focused on other uh, specific issues like climate change or, or uh, you know, waste management, those kinds of things that are also extremely important and a part of that bigger puzzle. Great, thank you so much, Marcus. And I know that last slide as well, um, there's a, a video being produced around different lifestyle actions, which which I think you know people talking about the kind of sustainable lifestyle actions in the way that you've also been sharing uh, the examples, including your low tourism, high social, um, you know, kayaking adventures in the archipelago. But great to see the range of actions, and it kind of gets to the point you've made about how sustainable lifestyle and education is both about our personal choices or personal practices. And it's also in this larger context of schools and cities and finance. And how do we bring all those things together to really see the kind of untapped potential that we were talking about around shifting, using the shifts in lifestyles and behaviors to achieve living well for all within the means of the earth. So thanks for highlighting those, Marcus. So you know, a number of people in the cohort and people watching this might be thinking about a lifestyles and education career or kind of career generally in the direction of the, the different initiatives you've been mentioning. So finally, what is one piece of advice you'd give for people who are just getting started and are interested in moving forward on these issues? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I've learned not to give advice. <laughs> What I could say is what uh, uh, what's worked for me, um, and um, yeah, well, I, I would say I would I would guess without having met all of you in the cohort that part of what has carried you into this work in the first place is uh, is a pretty strong measure of idealism and curiosity. And uh, I guess first and foremost, I would say, hold on to that idealism and curiosity and foster that. Don't, don't let it go. Uh, keep on developing it and you will find unexpected places uh, where you can put that to work and where you can uh, work in ways that are really, um, that you can get a lot of satisfaction out of that lead you to the next uh, next opportunity that will sometimes be something that you plan and sometimes be completely unanticipated. So maintain that idealism, curiosity, stay flexible. Uh, and let me just add one last insight from sociology that I think is really important and valuable. A um, uh, sociologist named Rogers Hollingsworth has done uh, pretty extensive work around the uh, the individual characteristics and institutional conditions 
that have led to breakthrough discoveries in the biomedical sciences, but I think you can generalize more broadly. What Rogers has discovered is that the kind of people uh, who are most likely to make the connections, to make these new breakthroughs, uh, are people who've had training in a number of different areas and are able to not only put those together themselves, but also connect more effectively with others with different kinds of expertise. So it's, it's about that curiosity um, and pursuing that together because this world is way too complex for us to tackle alone. We need to do it with teamwork. And in order to have that effective teamwork, we need to really be curious about one another's knowledge and one another's experience and one another's work and be able to dig into that to identify the, the spaces that are yet un, unexplored or insufficiently explored between our, our different uh, types of expertise, because that's where the magic is. Uh, so develop that, be curious about each other's work and uh, find the people you really find exciting to work with and, you know, and dig in and keep it up because we Thank all depend you, on it. Yes. Thank you so much. This has been the Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Leaders uh, session and series. I'm Vanessa Timmer with One Earth, and this has been Marcus Carson from the Stockholm Environment Institute. Thank you again. Thanks, and good luck out there. Thank <laughs> you.